So I've, I've been a student here with the Social Development Center of Waterloo Region. I've been with the SDC since September um, and very recently my father passed away. His name was Joe. Uh, he was born in uh, like not like North North Ontario because Ontario is pretty big but uh, like Midland Penetang zone. Um, he grew up in Toronto, um, traveled a lot of North America hitchhiking, <laughs> um, was very much a hippie in the 70s and the rest of his life. Um, then lived in British Columbia for a good chunk of time, which is where I was born. My dad, my dad was very poor. Um, he had left home at 15. Um, there was family violence and not a good place to be. So he had left home really young um, and, and didn't have a lot of advantages that you that you have when you have a, a stable family and a like, safe community. Um, so he had some difficulties keeping work, um, but when he did work, he worked as a carpenter. Um, before I was born, um, he decided, you know, he didn't want to rent, he didn't want to have the possibility of something as critical as his housing being, being taken from him. Um, so what he did was um, he would buy these trailers, like semi-trailers, like the ones you see on the highway, like the 18-wheelers, um, and craft those as, as things that he could live in using his skills as a carpenter. Um, and he, what he would do would be come up with um, arrangements with, you know, he'd find like a shipping yard or something like that um, where he could could live where they might you know need on-site security and basically exchange being 24 7 on-site security for a place to live rent free to park his trailers and, and live in so he was doing that before i was born and lived that way my whole life and became a thing that he loved and was fiercely proud of because you know in my whole life like he i think he's paid rent for a few months um of course it was not legal, which has always been like the biggest kind of obstacle there. And he, um, he's got, oh my God, so many guitars. He's, he's a really enthusiastic musician. He records his own music and um, wrote essays and poetry um, and really conveyed a lot of his soul through those things. Um, it's really nice kind of being his daughter and having those things to remember him through. Um, yeah, no. Eccentric, opinionated, it's, we were close. <laughs> as you were speaking, I'm like, wow, imagine like, um, you said like he didn't want, like just having that, that, that possibility of just having your house taken away, like your opportunity and like, uh -huh. just think of how many people live That's in that fear, you know, like at any moment, like if you lose a job or something happens or something happens to you, you can actually lose that house or lose a place for your kids to live or anything. It's, it's, it's scary. And I really like to know that I, it's really nice to know that he actually decided that he's gonna figure out how to live and um, and make it happen for himself. I remember one time, um, I can't remember exactly when this was, but probably sometime in the last decade, he, he actually is able to remember like the number of unique places that he has lived throughout his life. Um, and they numered in the hundreds, like he has moved hundreds of times he also didn't do great with like authority figures and control like you know if someone was trying to tell him what he could or could not do with his space he wouldn't be successful staying in that space so yeah he responded to that by figuring out a thing that couldn't be taken from him um, and it and it did it did continue to be precarious right um because technically how he was living wasn't legal and he he felt that stress i know that he did we talked about it often it was a thing that really upset him that you know a way that he was living that was um very safe and and felt very permanent for him um could theoretically be taken you know if he was found out that he was living on these places that are not zoned residential and you know in a home that he um hadn't necessarily had like inspected for safety um but like he was a carpenter, he knew what he was doing. Um, he had friends and even a brother who were electricians that helped him, you know, set it up to be safe. Um, the problem was just that it's technically illegal, but he was always safe and he was always securely housed. This like very artificial obstacle that we've created around, it wasn't legal, but like why? What, what purpose did that serve it? It just made him very stressed.
I see guitars in your background. <laughs> Can you see them? Oh my goodness. Um, yeah, there's, okay, my, my space is really messy, but let me show you. There's the ones there. Um, there are oh. more there. Yeah. Uh, including <laughs> one on the floor. And there are more here. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm fortunate that my, my partner does does play. I do not. But I think we came into possession of at least 10 guitars. So, like, I'm going to have to learn. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's beautiful. You should definitely look into learning and playing some of his songs. It's really nice. I'm going to have to. There's no other excuse to have this many guitars. <laughs> yeah. His life. Yeah. He was on, uh, he was receiving pension and old age security. Um, and that was a lot of money when he didn't have rent to pay. And so, yeah, he was able to accumulate things that made his life very meaningful. And a lot of that was music. And were your parents, when did, it, when did they separate the boys? Like, yeah. Um, so they were together when I was born. Um, I was born in a hospital in British Columbia, and when I went home, I went home to, to the trailers. I was raised um, in my dad's trailer. He was living in one of them there, um, him and my mom. Um, and they separated when I was about four, um, but amicably enough. Um, and you know, my mom and I moved just kind of up the hill from from where he was, so he, he remained in my life and, and nearby. Uh, actually, the yard that he was in was um, really beautiful at that time. It, it was in British Columbia, um, near the Fraser River, which is like the big, the really big river in that zone. Um, I'm kind of grateful that um, for all the sacrifices that both of my parents did, that, that it was only for one kid. I think it made, it made things a little easier on them, I hope. Yeah, so I... Mostly lived with my mom, as I said, um, like blocks from my dad, a few big blocks, but um, not far. I would see him on weekends. Um, my dad did have um, significant struggles with mental health. They did get better as he aged, which was awesome. Um, and he made a really good effort to be like really good when I was young. Um, my mom had kind of had an agreement with him that like if he wasn't doing well, uh, like he'd just, he'd have moods and, and temper and um, you know, she had him figure out a way not to bring that around me. Mm -hmm. Um, so he didn't come around if he wasn't in a good, in a good headspace. So, um, my childhood was actually really happy and I was really sheltered from some of the worst impacts of, of the toll that his life did take. Cause it, it was a lot of stress. There were times that you didn't see that. So mm -hmm. those were the time when he wasn't doing well and it was mainly for your safety. Yeah, I have to guess. Yeah, um, and only emotionally. Like he, he was always very good. He was, he did like the very best job, being the very best dad that he could be. And, and yeah, sometimes that meant not coming around if he wasn't going to be in a space that was going to be good for me and, and happy. So it meant that any time I did get to see him, I, I had a very affectionate, warm, loving father. Um, such a healthy dynamic. Um, out there. Yeah. It's really nice to know, like sometimes our parents do things for a really good reason. Yeah, she did a great job of, uh, you know, like communicating those boundaries and putting it in a way that he didn't get defensive about. Like he acknowledged that that wouldn't be great for a child and um, like he, he followed her lead, which is hard going through separation and you know, with her raising his daughter and um, and probably worrying about whatever influence she'd have on me. Um, they worked it out really well. Yeah. It is. I um, need to convince my father to be okay with getting old. Everything <laughs> <laughs> else except the, the age boy. So It, it makes a difference, way. right? Like, and having a parent be okay with that, like, helps you also be okay with exactly. that. Exactly. I loved, I loved what he said about it because I, I feel that too, like you get emotionally flooded, like I remember my teenage years are so intense and you get older and you just, it, it gets a little bit easier to let it kind of slide and it's nice. <laughs> Look forward to getting old as dirt. Just embracing the knowledge that it comes with it and just knowing that, you know, I, I, I made it through, I did all this and yeah, and, and having a full life to look back on and uh, to live in a place where it could be taken away from him. He didn't want to live in a place that wasn't that wasn't stable and he couldn't guarantee um, 
And he, yeah, responded to that quite brilliantly, right? By making sure that he had a space that could be his own. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think, I think the first place he ever had his trailer was under a bridge in another shipping yard, under a bridge that goes over the Fraser River. Possibly. His first space ever was under that bridge. Um, and then, like I said, when I was born, he was in a, a different yard in a different spot near the river again. Um, yeah, like the nice thing about that was he was able to kind of pick what zones he might want to be in. And, and yeah, he'd just approach different yard owners. And um, it was important to be able to, you know, keep a good relationship with those people, um, which involved, you know, sometimes keeping his mouth shut if he didn't like how things were done. Like, but he learned to do that. Um, in a way that I don't know that he would have done if it was like a landlord situation. Yeah, yeah. yeah so he, he lived in one, two, maybe four different yards across my entire life. Um, and there were there were times when he'd only have one trailer and then there were a couple of times when he had two and he'd have them side by side. Um, yeah, yeah. And then you said he was a carpenter. Um, so how did he, how, how did that work for him? He mostly would be quite independent with it. His independence was very important to him. Um, yeah. liking who he was working with and working for and not feeling owned was very important to him. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, he'd, he'd find people in a job that he liked and if he liked them, he'd continue taking jobs with them. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that a lot of the times that he was working might've been in a time when that industry might have been a little less regulated than it is now. <laughs> you could kind of sign up for a job um, on the day of if they just happened to be looking for people who could do it. He yeah. told me there was one day where he had three jobs in a single day where he, wow. you know, had turned up to one yard, didn't like the guy, left, <laughs> went to another spot, had it out with those guys again, left, and went and found another one um, all in a single day, which is like, very much my dad <laughs> like if he did not like you he could not tolerate doing that um but you know over the years like he found people that he did like working with and mm -hmm. um like kind of built a network that way so he was always able to find work if he did want to work yeah. um and of course without having significant bills to pay he could also kind of pick when he worked and what hours he'd be willing to work and, and pick his jobs that way yeah, and it, um, obviously, like, I think he learned just on the job. I think he found a mentor yes. um, that he stayed in touch with, like, his whole life, I think, um, who who taught him the trade, and um, he always had work with that guy if he wanted it. Um, and, yeah, like, a, a friend and a friend and mentor, um, and it gave him the skills that eventually, like, kind of formed a, a, a rock and a passion in his life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he was he was very much a passion driven guy. Like he needed to love what he was doing, or he would not do it. It's so important. It's so important to love <laughs> what you do. And I like the fact that you're like, if he didn't like, he just leave. And I'm like, ah, something to mind. <laughs> and what a what a world! Like what an economy! What an idea to be able to like, if you don't have bills or if your bills are paid, like that's a freedom that he like that he found for himself in the midst of like not having. Like, like he wasn't able to have those choices because he was fabulously wealthy. He had those choices because he solved the problem of needing a place to live mm -hmm. and a roof over his head without bills to pay and like, did it. Mm -hmm. And that gave him so much choice. It, I feel like um, it's back to mental health too, like choosing if the environment is toxic or you already know how it's gonna work, it's like, do I protect my mental health and stay here or do I find something else? And I feel like with the strain that our generation, like the rest of the population have, like it's like you can't even afford to choose your mental health over your job. It's like, you know, yeah. I pay the rent and I make sure my child's fed, all this, or do I yeah. be peace and go try to find something that I know will make me a bit more happier and a bit more in peace and in touch with my emotion over losing it just to pay rent, right? Such. And I think like the reality of it for him was, um, there were parts of it that were beyond his control. Like he, I say he had a temper. I mean, like if he was mad, he couldn't not tell you, um, which made it very hard, um, you know, for him to keep work and 
you know, renting units and stuff. Um, and he sort of, you know, like, it's really hard to work through those kinds of things if you don't know where you're sleeping the next night. What did he need? He needed a safe place to sleep. He needed freedom to be able to walk away from situations that weren't working for him. Like, he recognized what his needs were, and he found a really creative way to make sure that, that he could do that, that he could always walk away if he needed to, which makes sense in the context of struggles that he had in his life and experiences where he maybe didn't feel like he had that power. Like, he always had a way out, and that was... Which did he visit? And what, which one did he like the most? Pardon me? How many places did he visit in... Like, uh, <laughs> the woods, oh, yeah. <laughs> the bush, as he as he called it. Yeah. Oh my God. Uh, <laughs> he used to just dream like aggressively about just taking off into the woods, saying goodbye to civilization, <laughs> just going out in the crown land, making yeah. himself a space. Um, you know, he reckons like it's sparse enough out there, like no one's gonna know if you're like squatting on crown land he did get lonely and i think he always underestimated like he romanticized the idea of taking off and living alone in the woods but if he were to actually do it he would find like no like he needs people <laughs> but uh i think that was a really special time too because it would have been just beautiful and i'm laughing because i have always wanted to live in the woods <laughs> 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 yeah, like we need to be able to divide our time. Like it, it's a good escape, and like you need most people. I think need need people. Like too much time alone isn't really good for the human spirit. I don't think. Um, and that and that was a, a thing that plagued him. Like my he wasn't the best at always keeping up relationships. I've kind of you know hinted at what he might struggle with there, and and like it it impacted him in his relationships. He was pretty isolated, which I think also drove that desire to just, you know, well, if he's going to be lonely in the city, he might as well go out in, in the woods and it, it wouldn't maybe feel um, socially imposed. Mm -hmm. But um, What did he share with you about his choice to build alternative housing and to live off the grid? Yeah, a lot. Um, he always wanted me to know about that. Um, if he hadn't had those trailers he would have been homeless in my lifetime mm -hmm. often i have no doubts about that mm -hmm. but he instead you know had this thing that couldn't be taken away from him and he was fiercely fiercely proud mm -hmm. that he had done that and come up with that um and i get it you know he he tried to, to convince me that that would also be good for me and it totally came from a good place like mm -hmm. he did not want me to be owned mm -hmm. to sell my soul to the man, very much his language, the man. Um, he didn't want me to, you know, buy into having having a mortgage that would own me for 30 plus years. And um, he really tried to convince me um, to, to do it his way. Um, and of course, because of the relationship of father daughter and me also having enough of his spirit that like, I also don't like being told what to do. <laughs> I kind of fought him on principle, if I'm being honest. Like, I recognized he had good points, but he was telling me how to live, and I'm like, no! <laughs> <laughs> and it's so funny. I'm, I'm, now that he has passed, um, that, that resistance that's, like, just on principle mm -hmm. is totally gone, and it hits so different of, like, wow, like, that would be great, and it, makes a lot of sense um but i also had some like valid points too which is that it would be very stressful mm -hmm. living in a way that was not legal that would be a lot and i know that he felt that too you know if if police were ever called to the yards that he was living in like he and people found out that he was living there illegally like that could be taken away from him um mm -hmm. again the like arbitrary nature of these laws like they just exist and they make it hard to do things like this i don't know that they serve the function that they're supposed to um but that would be a lot for me to take on especially as someone who's like really shy to break rules <laughs> and also like there's a gendered piece there as well um of like he lived in you know these shipping yards mostly worked by like really masculine big guys um I knew many of them, great guys, many of them, um, but like it could be tricky being 
a young, maybe, maybe single and independent um, woman to be, I wouldn't want to swap right into exactly how he was lived. Uh, but these were also places that, you know, could be um, lonely and isolated or hard to get to, um, dark. <laughs> and, you know, part of his agreement was being that 24-7 on-site security in between, between him, who's like such a free spirit, <laughs> living off the grid, living very illegally, making it work. Um, and like my mom, who, for many reasons, not least of which being like, single parent pretty much sole income provider yeah. for me like she like works for a company is like pretty corporate like she's businessy um mm -hmm. and like she loves what she does and she would do it even if she didn't because mm -hmm. she had me to take care of um and i find i'm in like this really interesting in-between place where like what she wants for me and thinks is best for me is like very corporate and like she totally supports what i am doing but like she would want me to have the stability of a job and a place to live. And he would want me to be true to myself and have a roof over my head. Um, and where I land in, in the middle of them, um, I, I feel like there's tension sometimes. The things that I really took away, like, and I understand <laughs> that there are things like safety of buildings, so they're not gonna burn down, like totally fair. Mm. But why are we not making it easier for people to have affordable places to live and making sure that we have new laws that pertain to really small spaces or whatever your living situation is. Like, I understand that there's a safety argument to be made and I fully am in support of those safety arguments, but also like we're in a national housing crisis. <laughs> we have been for a very long time <laughs> and the fact that like there isn't much middle ground between like what was legal for him to do and unattainable because of the challenges that he faced and living in poverty and like everything that he had to deal with and the fact that like what he was able to do wouldn't technically be legal and could be taken away from him for some arbitrary things that like maybe didn't even apply like again like i said you know like he had these places inspected by electricians and you know, he knew what he was doing as a carpenter. Like, he was very safe. There was never a single incident. Yeah, like, the obstacle was just always, where can he do this? And finding, you know, an owner of a lot that's willing to take on that risk of knowing that what they're doing, taking on a tenant in an industrial zone, is not legal. Um, that was always always an obstacle when you think of like the social dynamics of it like he wouldn't want too many people to know where he's staying because again it's precarious and if people know it could be taken away um but there are all these laws around um first of all like if you're living in a place that is on wheels different rules apply for building on wheels and, and his was because he's living in a semi-trailer and then there's also rules around like the size of places and then municipalities will all have different bylaws around the kinds of structures that they allow, um, the kind of building that you can or cannot do in that zone. Um, so as I kind of come to terms with, am I going to try to keep it? Or if not, I don't want to get rid of it. It's like the biggest thing that my dad has left me. It's so meaningful. It feels like him to be there. Mm -hmm. um, but figuring out where to keep it, like, and it's just really painful, like, knowing that, like, we're in a housing crisis, that there are so many Canadians, not to mention people all over the world living with housing and that this is like an option and that we just have these made up rules that say like, no, it's actually not an option. <laughs> your options are be able to afford your own place or be able to rent. And we really don't protect people who rent um, or, or be homeless. <laughs> like those are your options or stay in a shelter. Like as though those are options. Um, we just, we think that there's like a spectrum and we really only allow you to be here or here in this middle zone, we we don't acknowledge. And um, like, that's painful. <sighs> really grinds my gears. <laughs> we just say, no, <laughs> like technically like, sure you can, you could physically live in a space like this, but we're not going to make it legal to have a space like this or like own a piece of place where it could be. If you own the land, there's rules around what you can do on the land. And if you don't own the land, where are you supposed to put it? Yeah, no, like he, he would have really great use of space. 
um, and he'd make them pretty well able to, to be in different, um, different environments. Like it, he's variously been without electricity, without water, um, without a, without, um, with or without like a septic tank. Um, like the first one that I was like born and grew up in, um, had a septic tank attached. It was fully hooked up to electricity and water from the yard that he was parked in. Um, the place that he was in after that, um, I think then he got into using um, a compost toilet, which is what he had until he passed, um, and which is still in the trailer now. I haven't done anything with it. The place has no smell. Like people, I think, stigmatize the idea of things like composting toilets. No, they're awesome. Um, and he would also get most of his building materials um, like salvaged. He'd just find places that were getting rid of wood or glass or things like that um and just kind of would come up with uses for whatever materials he found um he ended up making like a shower out of he found like these really big beautiful like storefront windows they were once so they, it's kind of funny like they were still stamped with whatever they were but they created like this beautiful glassed in shower um yeah he'd you know get um people people return like the rest of paint that they haven't used um at, at like recycling centers so he'd go there so all of his paint was like i don't know that he paid for paint um and any kind of salvaged wood that he'd find he'd he'd work into um whether it was functional or aesthetic so so the one that he was last living in that that i now have um he's um like there are there are rafters basically um, and he's he's got like boards going across the top and then with plywood and it functions as like storage space. It's like above your head. You don't even think of, you don't miss the space. Uh, and it's also got like a really nice aesthetic of like feeling like you're walking under rafters and there's, um, there's like a, he's got a ladder that goes up it and he'd find bits of rope, um, wrap the rope around it. And it's got like a nautical vibe. <laughs> Yeah, no, I just, I really admire his, um, his aesthetic and use of space. He used bunk beds, um, so that you're getting, like, he had places for multiple people to stay and sleep in, um, 420. I actually think there's a lot to be said for mm -hmm. living more minimal. <laughs> like, like, I mean, like, there's a whole movement around this right now. There's a whole movement around tiny homes. And, like, I do think that some of it comes from the fact that, we're in a housing crisis and like in order to have places that yeah they can own and afford people are going smaller um but i also think like regardless of that like there are compelling reasons to go minimal it's more environmentally friendly and i mean my dad was recycling everything um recycling and upcycling like the amount of like actual garbage that he produced very very little and it's much more environmentally smart um it's cheaper and like i think that there are like nice things that can happen in your life from having less like you value what you do have you make sure that what you do have is is quality you yeah i i see the appeal of like only having a few things and like loving what you've got which is how he was like he loved everything that he did have and he didn't have a lot but he loved everything that he had to downsize or go minimal like we make it so hard to do we make that really really hard to do especially if you're trying to be in an urban area and like that's where most people's jobs are like people need to be in urban areas and those are ones we make especially difficult to have any kind of zoning or any kind of structures that like aren't aesthetically pleasing or and we need to acknowledge that the systems that we do have and the options that are available um aren't great and don't encompass everything and you know like my own analysis of the gender piece like we need also to consider things like safety for people whose safety will look different and that's not just women um, and we need places that are accessible and we have these laws we have these things that make it harder but the most important thing should be that like everyone should be housed and if the options that we have aren't working, then we need to change what our options are. Like, it is not acceptable that we have homeless people in a country as well off as, as Canada. What about us? I mean, I mean that homeless population, is, it's insane. I mean, what about the work that we need to do to figure out 
how to fix Canada the first and the people of Canada before we try to like go help out other people. It's like the, uh, the analysis of like not, not cleaning your house, right leaving your house clean, like going and helping somebody else clean their house. It's like, uh, well. Mm -hmm. I know that could be worse. It is also very problematic. Uh, but yeah, like, how dare we pretend like we are some like shine beacon? Of are there any lessons uh, that you have internalized uh, from watching how your dad chose to live? And if the law says you can't do this, but you need to do this, then the law is wrong, and therefore, like, shouldn't matter. <laughs> like, he was a good man. If a law is making it hard to take care of people, then, like, the law is wrong. And it should be, like, humans first. <laughs> Thank you so much, so much for being here and giving us the insight of who your dad was, how he lived his life, and how was he as a father, and just the joy that you brought. That he was not an, an easy guy to like all the time, and like for sure he wasn't. <laughs> there were long, long stretches of time where we, where we didn't talk, um, but he also worked very hard um, to be like he was doing the best that he could i never ever doubted that and i think that that really also taught me a lot about people and the nature of people like even if it didn't look like he was doing everything that maybe people thought a dad should be like i always knew he was doing the best that he could there were things that were out of his control and it reminds me that like people are always trying their best It's not something I do every day You dressed well and made a good impression Backed out of the driveway and did not stay Now you're flying down the road Why don't you do the same?